Okay, so welcome to the second episode of Behind the Helmet. And I want to go ahead and let you ladies introduce yourselves. And we'll start, we'll go in alphabetical order. That's the easiest way to do it. So that means, Emmy, you're first. <laughs> hey, hi, I'm Emmy Hall. Um, I drive a two-seater 1600 desert race car that is powered by an air-cooled Volkswagen engine. And uh, the big thing for me right now is um, I'm leaving on March 16th to go to Morocco to race, well, rally to, in such a rally in the um, Rally Ayesha de Gazelles, which is nine days all off-road in Morocco with no GPS. So all your navigation is done with a compass and an old map. And it's not about fastest time. It's about shortest distance between the checkpoints. So I'm crazy getting ready for that. And I will not be driving an air cool books back into that. And that I will have an Isuzu D-Max 4x4. Um, okay. Uh, uh, <laughs> how do we follow that? <laughs> oh, no. Like, <laughs> We should have went last. No. <laughs> Here, let me do it for you. My name is Shay, and I'm the Shiznit 2.0. <laughs> <laughs> I am, I am like, race at every racetrack that's ever possible um, in all of America. <laughs> I gotta say, when you tweeted that to me, what was it today or yesterday? At what Shay point? Shay 2.0. I was like, Emmy, oh, you kill me. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, so, well, it's it's not really my turn yet. It's been it's, a turn. It's my turn. I thought we were doing an alphabetical order. That makes Shay next, right? Whole <laughs> man. Sure, I'll go. I'll go. Okay, hey everybody, thanks for tuning in. Um, my name is Shay Holbrook. Um, I drive in Pro World Challenge touring car. Um, Emmy's definitely way cooler than what she made me she made me sound. She's very very uh, nice and humble. Thanks, Emmy. Um, but um, but I have a lot of like fun, exciting things happening this year. I'm not ready to announce a whole bunch of them yet, but um, but I'm trying to get behind the wheel of a lot of different vehicles. So Ooh. it should be fun. And um, hi everyone. My name's Pippa, and I insisted going last because I thought we were doing it by surnames, not first names. So oh. maybe that's the long gene kicking in as per usual on the other end. Um, I'm not as cool as Emmy or Shay. Um, and kind of in a similar position to Shay that I don't have stuff I can announce yet for this year, but uh, at the moment I'm working on this year's Indy 500 and I'm kind of pounding the pavement hoping to be back in that again. Um, and also hoping to drive some other stuff later this year too. Other things I've got going on this year is I'm doing the radio commentary for the Firestone Indy Lights series throughout the year on IndyCar Radio. Um, and I'm actually standing in for Davey in the TV booth in St. Pete, too, so that'll be my U.S. TV debut, so that'll be interesting. <laughs> cool. You know, we stand on the other side of the camera in, in, in the States. <laughs> Bad joke. <laughs> I got it. <laughs> All right, I'll go ahead and start asking some of the questions that fans have submitted. And I'll go ahead and ask... Um, one of the first ones that was submitted first, I um, mean, it was submitted, and it was to ask Pippa, and I guess Shay, it could kind of work with you too since you've worked with Glass Hammer some. Um, it says that um, you're such an inspiration and an amazing role model to young girls and older ones too. What do you find most satisfying about working with the Glass Hammer program? Well, if the boss is watching, I'm actually probably going to get myself into some trouble here. Um, the boss, Greg, who's the founder of Glass Hammer Racing, he finds most satisfying when we get the really, really young, scared girls come in to drive the carts for the first time, and they see them grow in confidence, and, you know, they leave with huge smiles. For me, personally, it's seeing the little girls who start getting racy, who are like, why can't we go faster? Why can't we go faster? That, 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 that's the most inspiring thing for me. Um, this winter, we've been working with a bunch of uh, local Indiana cart drivers, and uh, they've been coming in throughout the winter, and we've been trying to help them improve their overtaking skills. We've been trying to help them improve their terminology, help describe what's going on with their carts. So hopefully when they get back outside this year, there's going to be an awful lot of guys getting <clears throat> beat by a girl. <laughs> <laughs> now, so you've coached a class too, right? 
Yeah, I mean, you know, I think one of the things that, like, I ran into um, is, you know, there's there's a lot of little girls that have interest in racing, but they don't know how to go about getting involved. And especially as, you know, I, I wasn't really young when I entered into racing. I was 15 years old, so I was a late bloomer, if you will. And, you know, girls that are like six, seven, eight, nine, ten years old and they don't have a background of racing, you know, I think if I was their age and I went to a go-karting track, I would find it intimidating, you know, being the only female. So the way that I see it, too, is Glass Hammer Racing is a catalyst to help, you know, bring young female potential carters you know, into motorsports and a female environment where you can feel as though you have like sisters behind the wheel with you. Mm -hmm. um, so that intimidation of being the only girl, um, you know, kind of goes away. You know, that's something that you'll have to obviously get used to once you, you know, become competitive because it's obvious that, that it's a male dominated sport. Um, but I, I think that's probably the biggest thing. And I really enjoyed seeing the fact that there was some camaraderie between, you know, the, the girls with each other racing. Um, I mean, that's something that I found to be pretty huge. I mean, you as well, Amanda, are a catalyst for, you know, getting women together in racing because, I mean, let's face it, like, the media really likes to actually put us in four corners and, like, wants to watch us fight. And that, a lot of the times, that's just not the case. <laughs> Completely understand. My daughter's wanting to start go kart racing. She's oh, begging okay. for. She's nine. She wants a cart like so bad she can't stand it. So <laughs> maybe someday. <laughs> hey, you'll have to. We'll have to get you up to Indianapolis sometime. Yeah. Get her into a class and you yeah. know, get her into one of our beginner classes and see if she likes it or not. I'm, I'm, I may. Confidence. Yeah, I may have to do that. That might make her feel a little bit better. <laughs> okay, <laughs> let's. Let's see. The next question is, um, they wanted. The, I, I'm sorry, I don't remember who posted this. They said, "Which roadster do you all prefer?" And I know what Emmy's going to say on this. Oh, I know who wrote th this. Is this is actually a, a Twitter friend of mine? Uh, this is from Andy White. Okay, so the question is, Miata Z4 or Audi TT? I mean, you can go first since I know the answer for yours. Well, but the thing is, right, I mean, it should be Miata because, of course, I, I daily a Miata, a second-generation Miata, and I love it. I mean, there's so many, there's so much stuff about it that's annoying. Like, it's underpowered, <laughs> uncomfortable. Um, there isn't a cooled cup holder, you know. But it just handles so well that I don't, I don't, I don't care. I drive it across country, like, I don't care. You drive it from D.C. to Florida. In I, drove, in, yeah, in, I drove it to D.C. and Florida in one night. In one night. In one night. Um... <laughs> You know, I drive it to California every summer, so I mean, so I love it. I haven't been in the Z4, so I can't really comment to that. Um, the TT, especially the TTRS, which unfortunately is not a convertible, but the TT Roadster, I mean, it's just fantastic, and you have the Quattro, and it's great, and it's sticky and all that, but I mean, I would be remiss if I didn't say <laughs> FRS convertible just came out at the Geneva Auto Show. I mean, it has so many things going for it, except for that useless backseat. I really wish the backseat wasn't there, but... And, but it, again, it's the same thing in that it's slightly underpowered, I and mean, it's got more power than the Miata, but it's still slightly underpowered. But it handles, like, I mean, the coupe is just fantastic. Now, I know that they were, when they were building it, they were planning on making it a convertible, at least that's kind of word on the street. So we'll see if it, ha how much, the, how much weight is added and how that really affects the handling and, and how stiff the chassis is. But, I mean, I can't, I don't think I can answer that question until I drive the FRS convertible. Then we will we will revisit yes. the question with you. Yes. <laughs> Pippa, which do you, which would you pick? TT probably. Mm -hmm. I'm a. I actually own a little Audi right now. I own an A3 rather than a TT, and uh, <laughs> <laughs> I uh, I drive it all over the country to get to the racetracks where I'm doing radio work and things. Because to be honest with you, most of the time I can't afford to fly. Um, <laughs> I'm not driving when I'm not driving myself on the racetrack. I'm normally driving to the racetrack because I can really afford to fly when I'm not driving. So uh, in a couple of weeks, she'll be taking me all the way from Indianapolis down to St. Pete in Florida. 
so that's going to be another couple of thousand miles on the clock, and I hope my little Audi will last me a good few years yet. But uh, she's certainly getting a beating in a few months. <laughs> You're going to have to wave as you drop through Knoxville to me <laughs> if you come down this way. I'm sure you do for most of. Okay. Shay? I'm going to say the TT. Um, I'm, I am oh, Molly is so winning! I can't believe it! <laughs> I, okay, but let me justify, okay, Emmy? The reason why is because I am an Audi fan, just like Pippa, I have an A4 1.8 um, turbo Audi, so, as my daily driver. Um, and I just, I, 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 in this, in this scenario, I, I'm more drawn to the Audi than anything else. If it was a Honda, I would be more drawn <laughs> to the Honda. So, um, but yeah, I would I would probably say that's that's my um, that's my two go to vehicle. Plus, I just got out of a Audi A4 DTM car, so I'm like hooked. I'm <laughs> hooked. <laughs> well, and if you've ever driven the R8, I mean, the R8 is just uh, so much fun, and it's so it's just sex on a stick. And you know, <laughs> I've had that car like in town and just driving around town, and people look at you. And I've had it out on the track, and it just it handles so well, and it, it the speed is there, and it's just oh, it was so so fantastic. So you know, if we're talking no, R8, it's so. both of you. <laughs> <laughs> That's my dream car, an R8. Yeah, it's it's fantastic. And the stick shift has a little slotted shifter, which is really cool. Yeah, that was fun. <laughs> <laughs> All right, next question is, um, what are your guilty pleasures? Oh. Shay, you can go first. <laughs> um, okay, now, my co I mean, th this really is my guilty pleasure, and I know it's so, like, typical, but... Anybody that knows me knows that I am a chocolate whore. <laughs> okay, like, I I just, anything that's chocolate, don't ever, like, don't ever give me something that's vanilla because I won't eat it. Chocolate on top of chocolate on top of double chocolate is, like, the absolute best thing for me. Um, gosh, I don't know. I would have to, like, what, I mean, what other guilty pleasures do I have? Um, God, I don't know. I, I like to sleep in. Like, if I can, which doesn't happen that much anymore. Um, but for sure, chocolate is, like, and it's my weakness. Like, it's it's a problem. Like, last year, my coaches would limit my chocolate intake. <laughs> like, and, and, I'm, and I'm like a bee if I don't have the chocolate <laughs> when I want it and the amount of which I want. <laughs> so that's mine. I can relate so much. <laughs> Pippa, your turn. <laughs> um, how long of a list do you want? <laughs> Go all <laughs> out. <laughs> the chocolate thing, um, but for me, it doesn't really stop at chocolate. If we're talking food, kind of anything I'm not really meant to be eating <laughs> is fairly high up there on my list of foods <laughs> that I'm probably going after. Uh, outside of food, I like some really, really. Uh, TV shows that are not critically acclaimed. Let's put it that way. Oh, oh yeah. I know what you're talking Certainly about. Certainly a Glee. Yes. And I, I, I watch Glee. I, I said I'd never watch Glee. I took the mickey out of other Gleeks, and then one day I saw the pilot, and yeah, but that was it. I was done. Um, I have some really, really bad taste in music. I'm not going to share. I have some good taste in music, too, but I have some really, really bad taste in music. Uh, then we probably get along. We, our musical tastes are probably similar then, because <laughs> nobody listens to what I listen to. Sing along to the top of my voice. I'll be singing all the way down to Florida, and for some of it, I'll be so glad there's nobody else in the car but me. Um, <laughs> Uh, another guilty pleasure, um, anybody who's ever seen my closet would know that shoes are a sort of really girly, big, guilty pleasure of mine. Um, I'm forever trying to find the perfect pair of track sneakers that won't make my feet sore walking around the racetrack all day. It's not possible. <laughs> <laughs> really, really girly and practical shoes. Yeah, I, I might have a few and I might tend to spend any disposable income I have on that rather than save it. <laughs> Next, quick, <laughs> Emmy. Um, well, I mean, I think we all. My my obsession with Diet Dr Pepper. Oh yeah. Fairly well documented. Um, even though they haven't 
yet approached me for any kind of a partnership, which they really, really need to do because I am a fantastic brand ambassador for Diet <laughs> because I do drink it exclusively. Um, but I mean, like the other two ladies, uh, I have terrible taste in music, but I don't mind saying it. I love old school rap. Um, Apple bottom jeans, <laughs> the fur. like I can't get it. So, Journey, I have Journey on my iPod. Um, I have Britney Spears on my iPod. Um, show tunes, all that crap <laughs> is there. It's ridiculous. Um, and then for TV, fortunately, I don't. I don't have TV. I just have Netflix. Um, but anything, any kind of TV show that has to do with um, uh, plastic surgery, <laughs> conjoined twins, and hermaphrodites, I will watch anything that has to do. And if it's all three together, oh my God, it's. <laughs> See now the show that I watch, which everybody I think everybody watches it is Duck Dynasty. That oh, everybody yeah. is like, <laughs> I watched that. Oh I, yeah. I had no I, idea that that show existed. I'm like, who are these it's people? It's hilarious. Like it's seriously <laughs> hilarious. Any, any show that's got some good old rednecks in it, I'm into. Yeah. Yeah. But I'm also into. I'm like embarrassed to admit this as well. I, I'm I am a diehard Mob Wives fan, <laughs> and. It just it's pure entertainment, like the 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 problems in their lives just kill me. It's like your your peep your peeps have been gone for a long time, you should just move on. Because they're always saying, you know, do you know who my daddy is? Do you know who my uncle is? Do you know who my grandfather is? And I'm like, nobody gives a crap. <laughs> Okay, there's more questions. Let's see. There's been a bunch posted on the... I'll go ahead and give you all this one. Let's see. Um, your favorite car slash racing related movie? Shay, you can go first. Since I already um, have you. Okay, so... My favorite car changes daily, <laughs> okay, um, but right now my favorite car is the P1 McLaren, and the, my, honestly, I still love a good old Ricky Bobby movie. I really, I just, I love Talladega Nights. It kills me every single time I watch it. I know the lines to it, like. I think, I, honest to God, I still think that's one of my favorite, although I am excited to see... Um, you know, 47 Gears and Fast and Furious movies. Yes. I am really excited to see that. And uh, just, I'm going to give Verena May a plug here. But Verena, uh, you know who Verena is, right? Mm -hmm. Verena yeah. May. So Verena, for like a solid 10 seconds, was in the, um, it was in Tokyo Drift. Yeah. So, so every time I see I th I see a commercial or I th I always think of Verena, but um, but I I'm I still love Talladega Nights and I really do like the 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 forty seven pulling the gears. It's like they're just never ending. It's like oh let me like upshift like fifty times, but it, ne mile, it never gets old. It never gets old. And the quarter mile that's like two minutes long. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> right. <laughs> Those are my two fa I like I'm a huge Fast and Furious person and I and, and Talladega Nights was just on the other night and I watch it every single time it's on TV. <laughs> <laughs> um I really like uh not so much a racing movie, but a car movie, I guess. Gone in sixty seconds. Mm -hmm. That's kind of a lot of fun. I like the car chases in that. Uh but in terms of an actual racing movie, um it's actually the first half of Days of Thunder. All the stuff of like when he first gets on the NASCAR track and he's wrecking and the stuff his crew chief keeps saying to him, it just has me cracking up and rolling around on the floor with laughter every single time. I think this, my favorite one might be the one about, you can't pit now, we're having ice cream. <laughs> <laughs> You're having enough trouble staying on the track as it is. That, you know, NASCAR's going to have a problem with it. It just absolutely cracks me up. Um, and of course, uh, being someone who's associated with IndyCar, I'm really, 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 really looking forward to seeing Turbo this year. I'm aware I'm meant to be a bit older than their target audience, possibly, <clears throat> but mentally I'll fit right in and I can't <laughs> wait. Kiss <laughs> Emmy, your turn. Um, well, my favorite um, car movie would have to be um, 
Dust to Glory, which is about the Baja 1000, which is kind of the, the seminal um, desert race that we have in the off-road world. And um, it really fall, it, it talks a lot about the race and the history behind the race and, and um, the cinematography on it is just fantastic. But it really follows um, a guy who um, Iron Man the Baja 1000 on a motorcycle. And I don't understand how anyone Iron Man's the 1000 and people do it in the car. <laughs> But to do it on a motorcycle, I think, is totally insane and crazy, and this guy did it. And it, I mean, it follows a lot of different people, but that is one of the stories in the movie. And um, it's something that a lot of people, uh, that's, it brings a lot of people into off-road racing because they, they watch that movie and they get inspired and they see the beauty of it and they see, you know, just the determination that, that you have to go through and the, the commitment levels that you have to have. And it really inspires people to come into racing. I know a lot of people, they're like, I saw that and I went out and I, I bought a class 10 car I, or I bought a class 11 car or whatever. And they, they start to race. So that's got to be my favorite one. Good. Then there's a question for each of you that's individual. So I'll go ahead and ask Emmy Hirsch first that people ask specifically for each of you. Okay. Emmy, yours is, how did you get your job on Roadfly? <laughs> You know, I was just at the right place at the right time. Um, Jesse Lang, who is now on Motor Trends cha um, YouTube channel, she had been working for them, and then she, um, you know, wanted to move on. And um, I don't know if she got already gotten the job with Motor Trend, but you know, she was going back to school, and um, she was in a she's a PhD candidate. I don't know if she still is, but at the time she was. So Charlie needed somebody, and um, he was like, "Well, can you do you have what it takes to replace Jesse?" And I didn't I didn't really know who she was, so I, I looked at her videos and. You know, Jesse and I are two entirely different kinds of girls. You know, we're just like apples and oranges. And so I said, look, I can't, I can't replace her because I don't have the long blonde hair and I don't, I'm not this short little petite thing. Um, so I can't replace her, but I can give you this. Like I can give you cute and quirky and funny and knowledgeable, but you know, I'm never going to be that blonde bombshell that you've got in Jesse. But fortunately, you know, Charlie saw that that was a, that could be something that could be good for his channel as well. And I mean, really, I was just in the right place at the right time. But I did make him like a little um, audition video. And uh, I watched it the other day. And I'm like, oh my god. <laughs> I'm the biggest dork. Like, it's just funny to go back and see, you know, the first things that you do. It just made me laugh. I might publish it. I don't know. It's, it's private on my YouTube channel right now. But I might make it public. <laughs> Okay, Pippa, your question is, um, which three races would you want to drive in besides the Indy 500? Oh, you, you took one of them right out of my mouth. Before I even <laughs> it. That wasn't my question. It was a fan question. <laughs> <laughs> besides the Indy 500, which three races? Hmm. Um, I love sports cars, so uh, doing something like Le Mans or the Daytona 24, that really, really interests me in the future. I'd love to get involved in some sports car races. Uh, looking for another one. You know what? Um, I couldn't tell you which one because I'd take any at all that I could get my hands on or had the opportunity to, but any other Indy car race I think could go down <laughs> as the final race I'd do, if that counts as an answer. It does. Sorry, I'm having to find Shay's question again. <laughs> <laughs> I had some of them written down and some of them I didn't get to write down. I was busy tweeting when you wanted to talk to me, so I had to like oh, put sorry. my phone. <laughs> Actually, I can't I'll ask you all another question while I'm looking for Shay's. Okay. Because there's like I have stuff posted on three different places. Um what kind of hobbies do you all have outside of racing? What? If if you have a hobby outside of racing. Hobby. <laughs> go ahead, Shay. You can go ahead since I have to skip you for now. Um, yeah, no. I I am a... So I, I, act, I originally grew up on the water. Um, I was a competitive water skier before I was ever even involved in motorsports. And back in the day day, um, water skiing wasn't really a hobby. Like It was like my profession. It was like what I wanted to do for the rest of my life. It was how I wanted to make a living, etc., etc. And then when I got caught up in motorsports, that 
completely went out the window and I, you know, traded in a pair of skis for a set of wheels type thing. Um, but now that it's not my profession, um, and I don't ski very much anymore, um, mainly because I hurt myself. And it seems as though every time I go out to ski, I'm pissed off because I can't perform to the level of which I used to. So, like, being a competitive person, just like we all are here, it's really frustrating. But if I'm out with friends, it's a good time. But I am I still love the water. I go boating as often as possible. Um, I, I can't believe I'm even going to talk about this, but my boyfriend, I don't even, I never talk about my boyfriend, but not, not in a good, not in a bad way. I just don't, I'm not very vocal about it with people, <laughs> but my boyfriend, um, he, he builds custom boats. So we have, we have plenty of boats to go out on and, um, anything that any like lake, river, intercoastal, ocean, whatever. Yeah. So I think one of my hobbies for sure is if I, if I can get on the water, I'm definitely on a, on the water with a beer in my hand. <laughs> Pippa? Um, I'm kind of a big movie person, um, and I'm also a big book person. Um, I'm going to turn the computer around a little bit, so I'm going to go off screen for a moment. Whoa! Oh, wow. So those are my bookshelves. Um, <laughs> so I'm a big reader, I'm a big movie person. Um, so th th those are kind of my few hobbies outside of racing. Other than that, I like spending time with my friends. And for us, uh, sometimes that involves going around to someone's house. Sometimes that involves kind of all gathering and getting dinner together somewhere. Uh, we're actually, there's about 12 of us getting together for a friend's birthday this Friday. So outside of racing, I'm kind of about being, being pretty chilled out. And, you know, movies, books, friends, um, watching sports. But it, I'm definitely more chilled out away from the racetrack. Mm -hmm. Amy? Well, it's, I don't. I, I don't talk about my uh, my real. Life. Well, I guess it's my real life. You have a cool real job, though. <laughs> I, I do. I have. I I kind of have the exact opposite, I guess, of of what racing is for my job, which kind of extends into my hobby. But um, I do some sewing um, <laughs> and girly things like sewing and and knitting, and it's something that I do for my day job, which is pretty cool. Um, like today, I spent all day um, making bow ties and ascots and cravats and little ladies, you know, fingerless mitts and, and things like that. So um, what's nice is that in my day job, I can do all those kinds of um, costumey things and, you know, and, and go shopping and spend other people's money and, and um, do art and, and be creative. And then, um, you know, later on over the weekends, um, I can get to go out to the racetrack and, and get dirty. So that's kind of cool and it's nice that I've been able to make make my hobby my um, the job that actually pays me money. <laughs> I wish I knew how to sew. I'm just going to say it. Like, because I could do some really cool stuff if I knew how to sew. <laughs> it's pretty easy. You just get a machine and thread it and go And then I'd sew my hand. No, I've only done that once. I've only done that once. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um... This is directed towards Pippa, but I guess it could be kind of directed towards all of you all um, because it's kind of a, a, a whole female thing. It says, um, what do you think of Danica? Do you think Danica leaving IndyCar hurt the series? You know, I think that's a really, really good question. Um, Danica was so popular and she was the most successful female driver that we've had in open wheel. But the issue was is that so much attention was always focused on Danica that a lot of other drivers um, you know, felt the, that they weren't being fairly represented by the sport. So I think it's given other drivers the opportunity to really shine. I think that um, Simona Di Silvestro, who's just joined KV Racing, another female driver in IndyCar, she's going to be full-time again this year. And Sim, Everybody in IndyCar knows that this girl is a really, really good driver. She's already started to really connect with the Indy 500 fan base, with the IndyCar fan base in general. Now we just need Sim to, you know, start to connect with some of that wider audience too. So I don't think it's her IndyCar per se, but it's certainly different. And we have certainly lost some of the eyeballs that we had on the series that weren't necessarily interested in the racing, that are just interested in how... Danica was getting on. 
So the big thing is, is you know, we want to bring back more eyeballs who are genuinely interested in the racing that's going on out there, because that's some really, really great racing in IndyCar at the moment. I agree completely. You sh did you read my blog I wrote about last about the Daytona 500 stuff? Yeah. Um, I read so many blogs about Daytona. You have to go read mine because mine's completely different than everybody else's. <laughs> I actually got people mad at me about it. So. <laughs> yeah, I think I did win read that one where you said that you didn't want that to be her first win because yeah, uh, some people Hi. will say yeah. Uh, <laughs> Hi, Erin. Hello. <laughs> you guys are doing awesome. Thank you. <laughs> because uh, some people will, uh, you know, try and shoot down everything, and you're always going to have the the little people who hide behind their computers who never show you their real name or their real face, and you know, want to criticize. And when you're someone like Danica, who has the attention of, that Danica has, I mean, there's just this vast number of people who. I think the expression is, is haters going to hate, you know, then there's nothing you can do about it. But if she won that as her first race, I can see why it would create even more of a divide because, you know, the people who say she's doing great things for the sport, and she is doing great things for the sport, but that they're going to go overboard and she's going to get even more attention that some of the other drivers might feel is unjustified when she struggles at places that are going to be tougher for her skill set. So I, I can totally see your reasoning, but um, that I'm sure there were a lot of unhappy people yeah. out there. there a lot. Not everybody was happy with me. I mean, there was a lot of people who agreed with me, but there was also other people who did not like it at all and, and told me they were unfollowing me on Twitter because I was being, <laughs> that I should support all women racing. But I was like, well, I'm not saying I don't support her. I'm just saying that I think overall that this is a better option. <laughs> No, if she could, if she can go out there and win a race later on this year, a, a track where it's going to be much, much more difficult for somebody to, or even in the future, it doesn't have to be this year, yeah. where it's going to be so much more difficult for anybody to argue with that win, I, I think you're right. I think that'll stand her in such good stead for the future. Yeah. Because it has to really grate on her that the IndyCar win she had in Montague, you know, with the fuel saving and the range. I mean, at some point, you've just got to want to turn around and punch somebody when they ask you that question. And so yeah. I, I could see the same thing happening with Daytona. So I, I get where you were coming from. <laughs> yeah. But, I mean, it's not just her that they that scenario has played out with. There's been other NASCAR drivers that has been held to a standard after that. And the pressure gets to the point where they just it's too much and then they they look bad so that's the only reason why I said that okay so next question um, what is your favorite track Emmy that kind of, you can go first since is you all <laughs> technically have tracks well we do I mean there there's there's a, a, a place that's clear of brush and bushes and such mm -hmm. that you that you try to stay on um, but, um, you know, I, I have to say, we just were at a, a race a couple weekends ago called Battle at Prim, and um, it's held behind um, Buffalo Bills Casino at the state line in Nevada, outside of Las Vegas. And I'd never done it before, and I didn't really know much about it, but it was kind of a short course thing where it was only, the, each lap was only 13 miles. Mm -hmm. And that for us is like nothing, you know, because normally you're out there doing like 70 or 100 mile laps. So, and it was really short. We just did five laps. And um, it started in like the the short course stadium, so you got some of that those cool like drifting corners and man made whoops and all of that. And then it went out into the desert, and it was like that whole race was about flat out pin it, and then holy crap, dangerous turn, flat out pin, holy crap, dangerous turn. So it was really fun because I had never been on a, in a race like that that was so much that was where it was, really had to depend on your. Um, on the absolute flat out speed of your car so, so much. Because a lot of times in desert racing, there's only a few places you can really pin it all the way and just go flat out. And this was like three miles of pin. You like you never get that in desert racing. So it was really, really fun. Um, and I learned so much about my car and so much about what it could do and where we need to improve. Um, but it was a very beneficial race for me to go to. And it was just so well run by Snore, which is a Southern Nevada off-road enthusiast. Um, it, it, that, the, so far, that's just that's been one of my favorite races for sure. Awesome, Shay. Um, I think that 
especially because of last year, like I, I typically really like um, the street courses. Um, the street courses and road racing are demand quite a bit of respect. Um, because when you think about it, I mean, it's wall to wall, pavement to pavement. There's no such thing as runoff. And if you're going to ball up a car, you're going to do it there. Um, but to be honest, I had a really solid, you know, actually I'll tell you backstory. So in 2010, I, um, my, my first like true pro race in, in a real car, um, my 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 first real pro race was in a 1998 Acura Integra that actually wasn't even qualified for the series, but I begged World Challenge to let me in, <laughs> at least for the one-off, um, and that was at the Grand Prix St. Petersburg. So, and then I got a new car, which was a Civic Si, a 2011, and we went to most Port Canada, um, and in the testing day, so not even like probably World Challenge um, practice, not qualify, not the race, but in the testing day, um, I wrecked the car really bad. And to be honest, it was extremely embarrassing because I came on the front straight, <clears throat> dropped a rear tire, spun the car, slammed into pit wall, and when I looked up, my I was looking at my team. So it was a very humbling moment for me, but and then fast and I wasn't able to race because the front end of the car was you know pretty um pretty mangled and to fast forward you know 2012 of last year I had a solid solid performance there um I think you know this is this ties into something else that I definitely want to like share with the viewers if they're wondering what the heck the hashtag steal over a nation is I can explain that to you um but that track for a lack of better words like re demands a big set of balls. Okay, I mean, you have to have like big cojones to to go out there and to perform well at this track because it's the fastest track in North America. I mean, it's flat out and it's flat out like every single corner. Um so it's it's more of actually like a fear factor and a um overcoming like believing and trusting in the car. Um, it's just like, you know, my car is not necessarily considered a downforce car, but like I know Pippa can understand this, like the faster you're going, the better that car is going to handle. Um, and, it, and it is the same in, in my Civic. And um, I think that because Mosport taught me so much over the past, you know, two, three years, um, and to go back there and to have a really solid performance um, in two podiums was really humbling for, for me and our team. Um, being that we we came from a past that you know we really got our asses handed to us at, at the race you know prior, um, so I think most ports probably one of my favorite. And the Canadians are so nice. I really <laughs> like them. I re they're really kind to us. So um, I think I think most ports probably my favorite. Um, you know, I just want to go back when you were talking about how the car is going to perform better when you're going faster, and how that really is a part of you know why you kind of came up with this steel over nation and. You know, even in dirt where you would think that that's not necessarily true. I mean, in my car, when you are out there and you're on the whoops, right? And you, that back end, if you hit it wrong, the back end starts to go like this and you'll kick up or you'll kick up like right. this back end. And whereas if you just hammer down and it's the thing that you don't want to do because your car is kicking up like this, you hammer down then suddenly you're going over the whoops and you're just skipping over them like that. And it's the hardest thing because it's so, um, it's just against your instincts. You're like, crap, I'm out of control. I'm out of control. I better slow down. Instead, you have to say, crap, I'm out of control. I'm out of control. I better pin it. You know, and it's, it's, so, it's so scary. And just getting past that and, like, feeling that fear and recognizing it and going, okay, I'm frightened now and I'm a little scared, but I'm going to do this anyway because I trust my experience that I've had with this car mm -hmm. and I trust, you know, the, the work that's been put into this car, that the physics of this car, that's what it's going to do. The faster I go, the smoother I'm going to be. Well, um, I uh, I don't think anybody actually needs me to tell them where my favorite track is. <laughs> <laughs> Fairly blindingly obvious, but if you don't know, it's uh, it is IMS Indianapolis Motor Speedway, and uh, I'm actually going to call you out, Shay, a little bit. I'm pretty sure it's a little faster than most sport. I think you meant fastest road course. Yes, road road course. <laughs> yeah. Road. Well, any any track could be Daytona's faster. I mean, road course. I apologize. <laughs> But uh, as Shay was saying, with um, you, you certainly need a fairly large pair of steel ovaries at uh, IMS in qualifying trim. It's uh, 
it, it gets your attention. Um, for those of you who don't know much about qualifying at the Indianapolis 500, you come out of the pits on your four nice stone cold tires, you go down into turn three and four, you come across the start finish line for your warm up lap. You have one warm up lap and then it's green. And by the time you hit turn three and four on your warm up lap, you have to be flat out and in the 120 plus mile an hour range. Otherwise, you're not going to be fast enough on your first lap to make the show because it's the average of all four of your qualifying laps put together. So um, you, you come out of the pits and you're trying to get this thing warm. You come into three and four and you think, hmm, I hope this sticks. And then the first time you come into one and two when you've taken the green, that, that that's the big moment coming up to one because you're going so much faster approaching one than you were going into three. And that's the big moment of truth, whether you find out what you got underneath you for the four laps. So, um, yeah, that, that requires some pretty big steel ovaries qualifying at Indy. I can't even imagine. <laughs> I can't. Okay, let's see. We'll get one more question because we're, we've already went over a little bit over our 30 minutes. So we'll ask one more question. Um, I guess we already know the answer for this for you, Pippa, but for everybody else, <laughs> what is your dream series to drive in? <laughs> Shay? My oh my oh okay. Um sorry, I forgot to say somebody's name. <laughs> right. Uh um you know, I've I, I've I've always since I've been in motorsports, I've always been really drawn to sports car road racing. And um I mean, to be completely honest with you, if it's got a if it's got a wheel and, and four wheels, I'll I'll drive anything, but I, you know, I'm kind of torn between because I'm a huge fan of DTM in Germ in Europe, as well as I'm a big fan of V8 supercars in Australia. Um, I had the chance to run a 2006 DTM car, what last weekend, um, which was really a dream come true, and it was just five laps, people. It wasn't even like it was a race, um, and I hope to drive the car again, and I, I think that that's you know a very um, you know, possible thing that I could get into again. Um, and then at COTA, when when Prelly World Challenge goes to COTA this year in May, um, V8 Supercars is going to be there, and it's going to be their debut race in the United States. So, like, for somebody that hasn't, you know, traveled outside the United States for racing, and to, first of all, see a DTM car in person, and in the fact and the fact that it's in the United States was a really cool thing, and then yet alone to drive it for five laps was amazing, and then to see V8 supercars again yet in person, and then to watch them on track, um, I th you know I don't know I'm kind of I'm kind of torn between the two. Um, I think that I would if, if somebody gave me a ride in a DTM car or a V8 supercar, I would jump on it immediately. I think those are probably the two premier, um, you know race you know road racing circuits in the world that I would like to go to but I mean I'm a proud American and I'd really love to stay in the United States um, so you know I want to climb the ladder and probably world challenge and run a few years in GT as well as I'd really like to make a transfer over to LMS um, so I think you know for sure sports car road racing is where my heart lies but Wherever that money's taken me, <laughs> and wherever those opportunities are, I mean, I I'd be really thrilled to to get some experience in other things as well. I mean, I drove I drove a a downforce car um, a Legere last weekend as well, and that was a different experience because the only other downforce you know vehicles that I've been in is Skip Barber cars. Um, so I mean, it was it was just a different it was a much different feeling, uh, and the fact that the, the the major different feeling is that in a sports car you're you're sitting as though you know you're in your typical every everyday driver car, and and anything that any kind of you know open cockpit open wheel type race car you're practically laying down. I just want to jump in for one second. Uh, I actually just got tweeted at. And um, they missed out the female racing Twitter handle, so I'm going to jump in with this one. Okay. John Reed wants to know when the Steel Ovary Nation website is going to be up, Shay. So uh, oh, you, you're, you're called out for people yeah. to ask you about it. Yeah. You've got to buy it. John Reed wants to know. I know. So let me. Okay. So. <laughs> 
I what when the truck when the truck race at Daytona was going on, um, I'll give you some backstory on this. So that when the truck race at, that Daytona was going on, the guy who won it, um, his his sponsor was Carolina Nut. So all of a sudden, I'm looking on Twitter and everybody's making comments about how he's got excuse my French and everything, but he's got big balls, he's got big nuts, he's got you know balls of steel, blah blah blah, Carolina nut. And I just sent out a simple tweet back um, in reply saying, you know, girls have big nuts too; they're called ovaries. And that just like started this chain of tweets, like just coming back at me, like, oh my god, that's his. Hysterical. Then I got Amanda, um, you know, F and R and, and on it. We got NASCARism on it and Press Dog, and we all just like went rampant and we created the hashtag Steel Ovary Nation. And then um, for the fellas, so we don't want to leave out the fellas since we have a lot of male, you know, viewers. Um, we have Broberries, so we had the hashtag Broberries. So Amanda and I started realizing that like like we really started something and so the website uh, to ask Amanda when the website's coming okay <laughs> ask, ask Amanda when the website's coming we're working on it we're gonna create t-shirts and you know the premise behind what Steel Ovary Nation is is it's for you know female fans it's for the female race car driver the female engineer the female mechanic the female spotter like whatever any female that has a role even if it's a fan or a mother, or a sister, or whatever in motorsports, that's what Steel Ovary Nation represents. And I really appreciate how a lot of, for instance, like, um, um, uh, you know, Race for Girls, and even some of the uh, Glass Hammer Racing Girls, you know, they've t put out a lot of tweets about it, and they've, like, you know, put me in it as well, and I appreciate that, but... I really want you guys to like find ownership in the hashtag and use it for like your everyday life. You know, it's for it's for it's something that's for us. It's to help with like the sisterhood and um, it's just flat out fun. I mean, steel ovaries, like you know, what the heck? <laughs> I'll have to see if I can um, get a sticker made up and we'll put it on the truck in Morocco. Yeah, we should yeah. do, I mean, it's just, yeah. it's a fun, it's a fun thing, you know, all these guys get to have fun with these hashtags and whatever else, and it's about time that us girls mm -hmm. get some, so. <laughs> and the website will be up soon. I'm honestly, I'm waiting on GoDaddy to resolve our DNS. Yeah, Danica, hello. <laughs> <laughs> hello, Danica. <laughs> So that's all. I'm waiting on that, and then I can get start really building out the site. It's not. It won't take long at all. Like I have it, everything set up and ready to go for the most part. Like once they resolve the DNS, like I should have it done by next week, like Monday. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So look out for the website. You know, anybody that wants to use it, feel free to keep using it. And then T-shirts are coming soon. Yes. We oui, we. Oui. Okay. Emmy, what was your dream series? We kind of got sidetracked. Oh. Um. Well, I mean, it, it, it has to be the SCORE series, um, which is now kind of merged with uh, Hydra, which is High Desert Racing Association. Um, and uh, they, those two have kind of joined forces. They're still separate series, but they're working together to join so that if you, and I don't remember what all the rules are, but, you know, if you, if you win championships in both uh, series for your class, then you're like the world desert champion, and it just got, now they have all these kind of crazy um, new titles that you can get, which is pretty cool. Um, but what's really nice about SCORE and Hydra right now is, um, especially for for people who are, who really need to, um, are dependent on partners to race, is they're really trying to step up the media presence um, at Offered Races. I mean, Offered is so difficult to publicize in regards, uh, um, in contrast to track stuff, because I mean, you know, you guys know where your cars are going to be at all times, and it's a very confined environment, whereas in, in desert, I mean, the Baja 1000, yeah, put that on TV. Like, <laughs> just think about the logistics for that to happen, for that to <laughs> so, but. They're doing a really good job at um, getting better spectator areas, mapping the course so that, so that spectators have easy access to um, exciting places on the course where, you know, people might be jumping or there might be a passing section or that kind of stuff. So, and, you know, SCORE does, this season, um, they are doing, they're only doing three races, which is the San Felipe 250, which is happening here um, this week. Uh, and then the Baja 500, which happens in June, and then the 1000, which happens in November. And those are... You know the the Baja 1000 has been over been around for over 40 years, um, and it's it's the 
one of the toughest off-road races in the world, you know, um, and it takes an extreme amount of logistics and a huge amount of people and resources. And unfortunately I don't really have right now. I, and, and, and just skill and, uh, and determination and, and the fitness that you need to have. I mean, you know, the, the guys that I bought my car from, they bought it and they just raced the 1000 in it. And when I heard the stories about what happened in that car, <laughs> They were throwing up in the car because they were just so they were so tired and so um, just it just took every single thing out of them. You know, somebody took a poop in my car. <laughs> like, you know, I, I know that sounds terrible and not fun, but oh my god, how much fun would that be just to put yourself in that in that um, with that challenge? You know, I'm gonna sit here and I'm gonna get a team together and we're gonna go down. We're gonna do the Baja 1000. It's it's kind of amazing and you know I've been there as a spectator and my dad has raced it um, and I, I just it's just something that I can't wait to do and it's not gonna happen this year um, possibly maybe could happen next year we'll see we'll see you know how money is um, you know if I have fifty thousand dollars to race one race which is what a lot of people spend um, so yeah I mean I would I would really love to do the score series but for right now we're just kind of hopping around to different series depending on what I can do for um, with work and um, hopefully our next race after Gazelles, which is, um, I leave March 16th, and people can follow me on that. Um, we've partnered with Jalopnik. So March 19th through the 28th, you can go to jalopnik.com, and they'll be doing um, daily updates for us. Also, Amanda will have some updates on female racing news. We'll have it on uh, Her Highway, which is a website that I write for every now and again, and uh, also on roadfly.com. So you'll be able to, a lot of different ways that you can get information about what's going on for Gazelles. So that happens... March 19th through the 28th. Um, and then when I come back, hopefully we'll be doing a 500 mile race in May. So much a 500 mile race to my one though, right? <laughs> I'm sorry, Pip, I didn't hear you. I said probably a different 500 mile race to the one I'm hoping to be doing in May. Yeah, totally different. Totally <laughs> different. It'll probably take a lot longer than yours. I tell you that right now. I've been in five, we did a 500 mile race in a, um, a stock Volkswagen Bug, which is basically like a 1967 Bug. Same engine, same suspension. I mean, it's it's beefier, but it's basically the same thing. I think we started at 6.30 in the morning, and we finished at 1.30 in the morning. Oh, man. <laughs> yeah, like, it's like, well, I, mean, I, I, I wasn't in the car the entire time, but, you know, you're still awake and doing stuff and chasing and figuring out who's going to get in the car next and all that stuff. So, yeah, it's crazy. It's crazy. Well, yeah. thank you ladies for coming and joining us on this. I wanted to make sure we got Emmy before she left for her awesome adventure in Morocco. I'm excited. <laughs> Is there anybody you'd like to, you know, plug or shout out or thank Emmy before you Oh my gosh, go? of course. I mean, we've had everyone has just been so um, so generous. So many of our friends and uh, and our family, of course, but um, just the other day I got a shipment from Max Tracks. Max tracks um, are they're like kind of like little surfboards, I guess, that you can stick underneath the wheel of your car if you're in sand or snow, and then you can just get unstuck. So we're very excited to have those. That's a product from um, Australia, and they've been at the rally now for the past couple of years, and it's going to be very, very helpful because there will be times when we are stuck. <laughs> I would put, so another team told me that they were stuck one day 15 times, 15 times in one day. <laughs> So our Matt, we're very we're looking forward to working with uh, working with Max Rex. Um, uh, Azunia Tequila has been fantastic in giving us some product to auction off and um, just uh, helping us out in a lot of different ways. Um, uh, the More Racing series helped us out. Um, I've got a list of everything. Um, all of our partners on our website at TeamCourageGazelles.com. Um, so people can take a look um, at our website there. You can learn a little bit more about the rally. There's some videos about the rally and what that whole thing's about. So that's at TeamCourageGazelles.com. I suggest everybody go. Like, it, it's for breast cancer, right? Well, our, our team is specifically, yes. The, yeah. the, the Gazelles does have a, um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Philanthrop philanthropic side in that 25% of your racing fees are donated to the Heart of Gazelles, and they provide um, uh, educational and medical services to the people in Morocco, but my team specifically is um, dedicated to breast cancer, and 
with this um, partnership with Jalopnik, um, we're in what's called the Media Challenge. So there'll be 17 other teams that have a media partner and have rented um, an Isuzu truck. So we have to beat those 17 teams, and if we do, we win 15,000 euros for our charity, which is FORCE, uh, facing our risk of cancer empowered. And they deal a lot with um, women who have a hereditary risk of breast and ovarian cancer. And um, my first navigator, Michelle Martineau, um, she is a breast cancer previvor, and um, she elected to have a mastectomy rather than um, uh, live with a 40% chance of getting breast cancer. So she unfortunately needed to go back for even more surgery. We thought that she was done and she's not. So she, um, so she's going back for surgery and I will have a new navigator that um, we've met a couple of times and she's done her training. So but it's still kind of a new team, but we decided to keep um, everything the same and we're still kind of, you know, keeping the, the breast cancer awareness um, as part as our theme. So we're very honored to be able to race for force. Awesome. Awesome. Pippa, is there anybody you would like to thank? Well, you know, at the moment, um, unfortunately, I can't share with you who my husband is. Like but I guess I just want to shout out again that um, all the work Glass Hammer Racing does, and, you know, if anybody watching this or who tunes into this afterwards has a daughter and they're interested in getting her started in karting, you know, we have a safe, fun environment, it's female instructor that's either me or one of the other girls, Glass Hammer, helps sponsor on track. And we'll give her a really fun time. And the website you want to go and look at is beatbyagirl.org. So it's a fairly cool website address, and most people seem to be able to remember it. Awesome. Shane? Uh, yeah, I mean... I mean, well, first of all, thanks, Amanda, for hosting it. Oh, no problem. Um, you know, thanks. I know Pippa was pretty last minute, so, like, Pippa, thanks for coming on. Emmy, it's so good to, like, chat with you again. I haven't seen you in forever. I know, right? Uh, I know. <laughs> and then, um, I mean, of course, all of our partners. Um, I'm actually really surprised one question didn't come up, but I'm not going to even mention it. It may oh, have, but I'll but, uh, but, uh, have but, uh, skipped it. <laughs> Yeah, all of our partners on board this year, you know, thanks a bunch. Um, and to be honest, I mean, the off season is not only tough for the drivers, but it's tough for the fans. So, like, amen to racing season starting up again. And thank you to all the fans who, you know, kept with, like, all of the drivers that, you know, are trying to keep relevant during the off offseason. Um, we really appreciate it. And I know the four of us, you know, we're big on social media. Um, it's, you know, sure – for maybe some of our own selfish reasons, just because we like tweet a lot, um, but we appreciate the fact that people, you know, like to t like to chat with us. It's a good feeling, and um, we like to chat with you guys. So, you know, I appreciate it. Well, thank you everybody for coming, and um, thanks everybody for watching. And in two weeks, we'll have our next one. Um, not sure who we'll have yet, but uh, <laughs> keep your eyes peeled to Twitter and Facebook, and I will keep you all updated. Yay! Bye, guys. Thank you.